Hi everyone, uh, this is Eric Johnson. And if you are uh, here for Log Tech Live, you're in the right place. Uh, I'm really excited to welcome our uh, longtime uh, audience and first time viewers of Log Tech Live. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Eric Johnson. Uh, I'm senior technology editor at the Journal of Commerce at joc.com. Uh, I write a Substack every Friday. The latest one just came out an hour ago, ericjohnson.substack.com, uh, if you don't read that. Um, and I host this show twice a month. Uh, it's one of my favorite things to do uh, every week because I get to talk to some of the most interesting and exciting people in our space. Uh, and that space meaning the intersection of logistics and technology, obviously, given the name. Um, have a great guest for you today, someone I've known for a really long time, and I have some of the most interesting conversations with uh, in public and on background uh, of anyone I know in the industry. So really excited to have him. Uh, I'll introduce him in just a second. Uh, but first things first, uh, as, along with thank you to all uh, everyone who supports the show uh, each month, uh, I obviously want to thank our sponsor, Far Eye. Uh, thank you so much. Coincidentally, I was actually supposed to be meeting with uh, the CEO of Farai today, we're both in India right now. I'm still in Delhi, uh, as I was the last time I was here. Uh, I was uh, with you guys a month ago. Um, unfortunately, traffic got the best of both of us. We were both hopelessly late to our meeting, so we're going to hopefully do that next week. But um, one last thing before we move on to our normal news of the week. Thank you so much to Sarah at Let's Talk Supply Chain and Brian Glick at Chain.io for kind of co-hosting stepping in for me last uh, show while I was uh, getting some R&R &R in Thailand. First time in Thailand. It was amazing. Totally recommended to everybody. The food is just spectacular. Um, but with no further ado, let's jump in as we normally do to some of the stories and news that uh, I find interesting. So first story that I wanted to highlight is one that I uh, posted a week ago. And it sort of relates to what I see is a very confusing market around uh, log tech, freight tech, uh, this industry that we are all sort of keeping track of and I've been writing about for uh, more than a decade now. The last two years have seen this wave of excitement and interest and most importantly, money into this space. Uh, it was most definitely a founder's market in terms of having uh, options to uh, which investment, uh, which investors you wanted to go uh, sort of target. Uh, and it was a case of investors sort of rushing in to get into deals, uh, valuations going up, deal sizes going up. That wasn't just in log tech, that was really across the board in a whole bunch of different um, tech verticals. So that, as we've talked about on this show, that's changed uh, a little bit. I won't say it's done a 180. Uh, but it's certainly changed in the last uh, three to four months. Some of it is just, as the kids say, vibe, right? Like the vibe has changed. Uh, the economy is slowing a little bit, um, although you wouldn't know it by first half U.S. imports, uh, which were up over 21. Um, the inflation is obviously a huge issue. We can't ignore that. Um, and also the Ukraine war uh, kind of... Uh, tank the, the, the public markets, right? And that's gonna have an impact on uh, the way that private markets are operating. And so what we've seen is uh, VCs telling me they are being a little bit more circumspect about the types of companies they are uh, now investing into, valuations coming way down, uh, expectations around existing companies, around them being a little bit tighter on their spend and their unit economics. So I tried to capture that in this story. I think it's worth a read. There's some great comments from a VC. Uh, and we also kind of lay out the sort of confusing signals about companies raising money, companies laying off people. I actually just tweeted uh, a half hour ago that Project 44 was the latest one to um, announce some layoffs, about 5% of their total staff, 3% uh, in, 3 in, uh, um, in talent acquisition. And so, a uh, lot of noise out there, and it sort of mimics the bigger economy as a whole, right? Like there's just a lot of noise in various different directions about which way the market is going. So um, next story that I wanted to highlight is um, another one that I did 
uh, earlier this week about electronic bills of lading. And that's a, that's a topic I've written about periodically over the last two to three years. Um, and it seems like there's been a lot of momentum in the first half of 22 around this from a, a bunch of different vendors um, and uh, both in terms of releasing products, tying up with various container lines and also a- acquisitions. There's been a couple acquisitions that have happened in the, uh, in the first half of 22 uh, S-Stocks being acquired by uh, ICE, the uh, the Intercontinental Exchange, I think it, it is, and most recently Bolero being bought by WiseTech uh, Global, the big forwarding software provider. So really interesting stuff. What I wanted to highlight with this story is um, the DCSA, which is, uh, we've talked about them a lot on the show as well, this consortium of container lines that's trying to drive kind of open source um, standards or blueprints for key processes in ocean shipping. They are testing right now with ExxonMobil and four of those vendors, uh, four EBL vendors, uh, to see if all of those systems can be interoperable with one another. Because all of these systems are sort of partnering up with different, or should I say, container lines are choosing different vendors to work with to build their EBL products. But as a shipper, if I work with five different carriers, I don't want to have to essentially adopt five different products from five different vendors. I want that all to be fairly seamless. So it will be really interesting to see what comes of this this project, which is supposed to wrap up uh, by the end of this year, to see if they can kind of drive that interoperability where it doesn't really matter which product you use or which which container line you're using or moving your goods on. You, it should feel fairly seamless through, uh, through that process. Um, so uh, more to come on that story, and, and maybe in the future it would make sense to have DCSA come on and, uh, and talk about this in a little more depth. So uh, file that one away. Um, the last thing I wanted to point out was my uh, substack from last week, uh, my newsletter that went out last Friday, which is about a topic that we've heard a lot about over the last, um, well, I don't know, year and a half, uh, when the supply chain when the supply chain crisis uh, TM uh, started uh, hitting last year and everybody started caring about supply chain for the first time and, and mainstream media really started to dig into this story, um, one of the things that came up is, well, if we didn't have international supply chains, we wouldn't have to worry about ships and port congestion and COVID lockdowns in China and all this and dealing with countries we don't really like their politics and all that stuff. So reshoring, which is no new topic, it's been a topic ever since we started offshoring jobs. Um, there's been a lot of momentum around, is this the time where we start to reshore? And there's some interesting data that suggests, yes, some stuff is coming back and, and U.S. Produ- uh, production is, is increasing in terms of the number of manufacturing facilities that are being built and the number of times that the word reshoring is coming up in uh, earning statements uh, from big retailers especially. Um, so it's all it's all kind of out in, in up for discussion. What I tried to t- uh, address here is, to me, someone who's covered international supply chains for twenty years, it's never as easy as it is in sort of a a, a statement to make about wanting to re- reshore. Right, the nature of our supply chains have become so inextricably linked with uh, a global footprint, and it's not just about point A to point B. It's about all the inputs that go into the product at point a um so you you can maybe try to reshore but you end up needing components for that thing that you're building from some of those countries that you were reshoring from or other countries right so i tried to address this um in this in the sub stack last week uh I, I hope it's worth a read uh it's an interesting topic and and i didn't come to any grand conclusion i just said that we need to maybe pump the brakes on this idea that we're going to move back all of our supply chains over the next five years um, So uh, with no further ado, I want to bring on our guest uh, for today. He is a chief marketing officer at a company called Freydos, which I assume if if you've been in international logistics uh, the last 10 years, you might have heard of or come across uh, Ethan Bookman. Ethan, thank you so much for joining me. This is a little bit of uh, payback uh, because Ethan's invited me a couple times on his uh, own podcast uh, for Freydos, and it's always a great time and always a great conversation. So it was only a matter of time before uh, I invited him to come on my show. It's a little bit of a home and away series. So um, thanks so much for being here today. 
Hey, it's such a pleasure. And uh, yeah, you know, I, I think um, I, I always, I love these conversations. It's, it's a lot more fun when there's people watching, but you know, in, in general, I think there's, there's so many things to unpack and I think you have such a good perspective on these things. I'm, I'm excited for the conversation. Cool. Well, um, let's just jump straight in because I have more questions than we probably have time to, to answer today. So there may be a part two at some point. Um, thanks, Sarah, for welcoming me back, by the way. I, you guys did such a great job. I was just going to go on permanent vacation, I thought about. So, uh, But I have too much fun doing this. So um, give me some background on yourself. Uh, we always talk about what Fredos is, and we'll get to that in a second. But I want to hear, what. how did you get to the point where you started at a company that's kind of trying to redefine what global freight is. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's so interesting. And I, I think there's so many other people that kind of echo this, which is, I don't think anybody really dreams of getting into global you know, freight when, you, when, right. This isn't like an astronaut fireman kind of profession. Um, and and you know, my, my background was a little bit more meandering. I, I, um, I, I was in government and military for a while, spokesperson, uh, got out after after a fairly long stint, after a good eight, nine years. Uh, and I'd, I'd always had this tech bend. You know, I'd, I'd always been interested. I'd always tinkered, uh, designed and sold websites in, in, uh, in college uh, for a while. So I, I like to poke around with code, but you know, I'm obviously not a, not a technical founder kind of guy. But I, I live in Israel and that's what everybody does. Like, in, you know, we're here, it, it, it's high tech central. Right? So... I knew when I was getting out of the military, which is so bureaucratic and it's so hard to move things and it's so hard to actually make a difference. You know, my tech background, the fact that it's like the default go-to um, all kind of brought me to tech, but I, I felt this allergy towards you know, the, the gloss of, of tech, like the, the social media, VR, AR kind of world. It, it just didn't really animate me particularly. Uh, so I, I spent a long time, you know, Israel, uh, luckily enough, it, it's a pretty easy market to be picky in. Uh, so I, I spent a while, I, I basically scraped a list of high tech companies in Israel uh, and started pulling together data. And and I knew that what I wanted was a company that was at seed round. So I just raised seed round. So there was a little bit of money in the banks, didn't have any marketing people on, on, their, um, on their team because I knew what I could do really well is tell a story. And usually startups, when they're first getting started, don't really want to tell a story, right? They want to get customers. They want to start working from day one. So I was looking for a company that was a little bit larger. And then I think most importantly, had a vision that that animated me. And I, I'd never thought about it in the past, but I reached out to a friend who put me in touch with a VC, who put me in touch with uh, Tzvi Schreiber, the CEO of Fredos, and, and the rest is history. So like I, I've... I literally fell into Fredos. Uh, this is the only high tech company I've ever worked at. Uh, it's been it's been a blast, and this is you know, it's 90 percent uh, uh, luck, nine percent very hard work, and and I don't know one, a little bit of one percent of, of creativity maybe. Um, but it's just been such a blast. I, I joined nine years ago when we were, Fredos was kind of still still wearing a diaper, uh, and it's just been really really fun to grow up together with the company. Yeah. Now now you're a moody teenager with your headphones on listening to <laughs> exactly. Uh, so super interesting. I don't know if I ever have ever actually heard you describe that that path that led you there. So and and the the sort of purposeful view of like researching the type of company that fit what you wanted to do is super interesting. So uh, I think most people are familiar with the word Fredos, but I I feel like first of all when I write about you guys, I feel like I could describe you in five different ways and all of them would technically be accurate. And if I, I feel like if I ask five people in the industry, what does Fredos do? They might all have five different answers, right? So, yeah. And that's, that's not a slide <laughs> on marketing. That's, you guys do a lot of things. So maybe can you walk through like what you think the essence of Fredos is? Sure. Yeah. And, and you're absolutely right. It, it, it's a, it's a very, very big vision and it's, it's really hard to break it down. And I wish, I wish that we had that, like, hey, we're an Uber for freight or an Expedia for freight, and and you know just really make it or a digital freight forward or whatever it is, and find it very easy to position. Uh, you know, I'll start rather than counter positioning with a different company. You know, the the high level vision for Freightos is to build a global freight booking and payment platform. It's really one platform that connects all of the different players within the global freight ecosystem carriers, freight forwarders, shippers of all sizes, right? And, and you know, you've, you've talked a lot about stratification and that 
you know, large forwarders, small forwarders, very different than, you know, the, the very small forwarders, the, you know, stratification on the shipper side. So, so really trying to build one platform that connects all of those different players, but specifically on bookings, like not getting into the visibility, you know, wormhole and not, not getting lost in, in the TMS side of things. Our vision has always been to try to connect the different players across the board when it comes to pricing, capacity, and booking. And sometimes you need to build additional layers in order to get in the door or in order to really um, digitize some of the different elements that we're trying to deal with. But that, that's been like the high level uh, goal. And, and I guess you know, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you, but the, the main building blocks that we've been using to do that is A, a company called Web Cargo, which connects between carriers and forwarders. Uh, started as a rate management platform, and as the industry has evolved, shifted from rate management into actual capacity and pricing and booking between carriers and forwarders. Uh, and, and right now, I believe we're the largest, if not one of the largest uh, platforms in the world for that. And then the second part is Fredos.com, which connects between logistics providers and shippers. And there's a lot of other things that kind of you can squeeze under that blanket, but that's that's the the big picture. And it takes us to a lot of different places. Cool. Um, well, let's dig into this a little more. Um, by the way, thanks to everyone who's chiming in. Uh, I think I've seen Canada, Poland. Uh, I missed a couple early on. Uh, thanks, uh, Nicole, in the background for popping these uh, these uh, viewers in today. I really appreciate all the support. I was, I was just um, thinking, I'm so jealous. I'm jealous of your engagement, man. <laughs> This is, this is I, just plug, I just plug into the mainframe. The, the, the system <laughs> is doing all the networking for me. I, you know, I cannot take any credit for this. Uh, Sarah and her team has done an amazing job with this. So um, one of the things that I found interesting, aside from your, the core business, the product is, and, and one of the reasons why we talk a lot is you do a hell of a lot of research into the industry that you're targeting, which makes Perfect sense, but you do it in a in a way that is sort of strat what I think of sort of straddles the line of like internal market research and public facing kind of market insights, right? And so you've done a survey for years that I'm, no one else is doing. Some other people now do it um, around uptake of digital tools, um, speed to quote, those types of of metrics. Um, let's, I mean, where are we in terms of, since, as you look and think back over this range of research that you've done, APIs, right? You've, you've sort of like looked at API usage in the industry. Where are we uh, in terms of forwarder digitization, in terms of carrier digitization, uh, as you sort of position yourself right now? Yeah, and that, that's a great question. I think that that's such a a simple but very telling question, right? Be because we do we 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 do a lot of research on this, and have have since I think twenty fourteen or twenty fifteen, and and I, I don't I don't think there's ever going to be a hey we're digitized or hey we're not digitized, and and also you know, if there's one thing that I learned pre before we got into that whole idea of, of doing research, you know we started like I think many startups in this space started with this very like hey, freight is broken. You know, everything is broken about it. You know, we're going to bring freight into the 21st century. Right. And and in retrospect, I'm not just tone deaf, but what a dumb thing to say, right? Like, obviously, global <laughs> freight is, is right, because global yeah. freight, it works. And it's this massive industry that's working and it works because a, a really large chunk of it is digitized. Like EDIs, we laugh at EDIs right now, but when those were first implemented, that was cutting edge and no other industry was doing that. So, you know, I, I think yeah. that it, it's so important to, you know, I, I, I have a lot of, uh, I think I, I have a lot of uh, catching up to do in terms of just apologizing to the industry and saying like, no, the industry has actually done a really good job. What has changed is I, I think the technology out there has changed with that, that created a lot of new opportunities. So you might be digitized, you know, the bar that we had set for ourselves five years ago for digitization. I think that bar has changed. And, mm -hmm. and that's why I don't, I don't think the industry is ever going to be digitized. I, but I do think that, you know, looking at the we try to come up with proxies. So, you know, you mentioned before we run this survey on a regular basis for online freight sales, how many com companies can provide quotes from their website in real time. And that was an easy one for us to talk about because it, it's something that's very much in our wheelhouse, but it was always just a proxy above the surface of how internally digitizes the company. Because without a very solid rate management platform, without solid routing, without 
um, solid business logic internally without a business culture that supports digitization, you're never going to get to that end goal, the little piece of, you know, of the iceberg above the surface that actually can provide that real-time quote. Uh, so some of the proxies that we look at uh, is A, on the, on the carrier side. And I think that's been the biggest shift over the past you know, couple of years. And what's really going to ultimately bring the industry forward is the carriers, the airlines, the ocean liners, the trucking companies that are digitizing. And that, that's that been, I think, the biggest shift. And I think that creates the biggest opportunity. But right now, we're at a point where over 40% of the air cargo industry or airlines representing over 40% of the air cargo industry are available for real-time pricing and booking. And for me, you know, as I said before, not about are they doing it, but just you know the back end that they have. Um, that that's a good marker. Forty percent is is really really solid. If you look, you know, you mentioned uh, right, and you, you mentioned you know bills um, digital bills elating in in the beginning of of, of the episode. Uh, if you look at how long it took for uh, for digital bills of lading to get adapted on the air cargo side, you're talking about the a timeline right of like, yeah, exactly. You're talking about like years. like yeah, exactly. And it's still not right. It's still not there. So the fact that we went from practically zero and five years ago into over 40% now, and it's not slowing down. I think that that's, that's a, that's a really good indicator that things are changing and they're changing really quickly on the ocean side. We're also you know, actually a little bit farther ahead just because it's much more of a, a fragmented, uh, much more of a consolidated industry. So yeah. right now, you know, all you need is the top five ocean liners to all be digitized and suddenly you're, you know, in 75% of the 80, industry. You've got 80% of the transactions, right? I, yeah. Exactly. It's so 85 rule instead of the 80, 20 rule. So. Exactly. Exactly. So that I think on that side, we're we're really really far ahead. I've started to think that maybe this the counting the percentage of top tier freight forwarders that can price and quote online. I've started to think that maybe that isn't the right metric to track anymore for how digitized is the industry. Because I think at this point, if somebody's not doing it, it's probably not because they can't do it as much as they've made a strategic decision Ooh. not to do it. For some reason, so you know, maybe maybe on a regional basis, that's a little bit different. But I, I, you know, I think the technology is there, and the and the companies that want to do it and and feel like it's valuable are have invested and have found the right online sales portals and online sales platforms uh, to service their businesses. Um, so, if I had to like you know provide like a general answer, I think we're about half of the way there when it comes to industry digitization, at least on the pricing and and procurement side. But I think that unless we keep on moving forward, we're going to keep on sliding backwards because there's always going to be more that we can do. Yeah. Do you think that um, what went on in the last two years in terms of disruption to sort of not just the, the macro market, right? Like, you know, demand went through the roof, uh, the nature of demand changed, uh, but also on an internal like a company workflow basis, like right? everybody had to sort of shift to, to remote. And, and this is like a two year old story that's a little tired now, but I, I want to like sort of do a postmortem on it a little bit. Um, do you think that sort of workflow disruption and shift bled into procurement, ocean, air, logistics procurement in a real way? Yeah. I that's that's a, a great question too. Uh, you know, I, I've obviously I've, I've spent a lot of time trying to trying to figure that out. I think it it very much depends on the industry. I think there's some parts of it that were already moving in the direct in this direction. You know, like ev like everything in the world, things were moving in the direction, but it accelerated because of that. Uh, there was a funny conversation with a woman from a large you know, top twenty airline who said that the biggest impact of COVID and remote work was just Zoom. That the fact that they don't need to fly all over the world just means they're that much more efficient. I mean, their their planes are obviously flying, but just for the meetings, uh, yeah. it just makes them that much more efficient. Uh, I, I think the the real silver lining that we're going to have on the logistics procurement side long term is that the 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 volatility within the industry, right, which has always been there. Volatility is a is a permanent characteristic or feature of global freight. It's not something that you know, is unique to COVID, maybe it was amplified during COVID. And there were little tastes or sometimes large tastes of, oh my God, I can't believe that we're doing it like this. So for example, on the air cargo side, long before ocean freight started to get disrupted already in you know, March, April, once the passenger flight stopped, uh, stopped flying, uh, 
suddenly the the static rates or the contract rates that every freight forwarder had with with their airlines went out the door right there was there was not enough capacity at all it became totally irrelevant and even when the airlines had capacity to sell you know albeit at like a you know, maybe a 400 increase on their pre-covid prices they weren't able to be in touch with the freight forwarders fast enough provide them with the updated prices in time for the freight forwarder to secure that capacity and and it just it became this, this total mess for forwarders that needed to move cargo time sensitive cargo not because they couldn't pay and you know airlines that wanted to fill that capacity but you just you can't write emails that fast right you can't fax that quickly and when you have this bottleneck of just an, an inbox things don't work so i think that was a really really strong driver uh for digitization mm -hmm. uh it it's a super cliche thing to say but you know culture is still probably the biggest obstacle for technology adoption and and and, and i, I think for the reason right so. yeah yeah, that's true. And and I, I think the the I had this conversation again on the airline side, but with, with someone from Air France KLM who who walked walked me through why did their sales portal from their website, like how why were they suddenly able to start selling online and during COVID specifically? And one of the things that he had was it, it comes down to internal being internally um disciplined to make sure that you are only providing one price. Whether if, if you have a customer that's coming and he comes to your sales portal or he calls up his salesperson, they're getting the identical price. Yeah. And that's not a culture thing. Uh, that's not a technology thing. You know, that technology has existed for 20 years. It, it's just a matter of like, are you are you built correctly? And I think COVID helped people adapt and maybe who cares about the technology was able to, to kind of shake the trees a little bit on the cultural adoption side. I, you know, it's funny. I think about. And I did. I'm glad we're we're sort of addressing the difference between air and ocean. And 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 I had a I had some questions about that. So maybe we can like dig into that a little bit more. If you if you sort of step back and think, okay, what is the what mode is most suited to a fast moving, dynamic pricing, like single single source of pricing truth across whatever channel you use? Air, right? Because of the speed, the sure. the Right, the the time between when a, when cargo is ready and when it's actually on the, the plane uh, is so much smaller than an ocean, where that urgency doesn't seem the same. Right, it's, we're talking weeks instead of hours. Right, and so, um, but uh, as I think about the way that some of the tools, whether it's it's the transparency and pricing through all the index numbers that are available, or the actual tools like Fredos.com and others that are empowering those um, that new sort of form of procurement, just something basic, like how long is a rate valid, right? Like how long is a, is a rate that you get online valid for in, if, if I'm dynamically pricing a rate and it's valid for a week, that seems incongruous, right? That same, sure. right? Yeah. The, the, the market's going to change a lot in a week, but that that's to your culture point, right? Like, it used to be rate was valid for 30 days. You had 30 days right. to decide whether you wanted that rate, right? So there's going to be these sort of like clashing of like the way we've always done it with the way that it can be done. And that's kind of messy. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, especially, you know, the air side, I mean, just, you know, from, from data on, on that I have, like you would typically take the end to end shipment from the time that you, a large multinational goes out to price an air cargo shipment for the time it arrives at the dest destination could take a week to up to 10 days, but that actual flight is just a day, right? <laughs> so like, you're, you're kind of like, well, what, what, what happened there? And, you know, on, on the ocean freight side, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. It's not, it's not, it's typically not nearly as time sensitive. Nobody's like, I, I need to get this component stat, put it on a ship. So like I can wait another 40 days for it to get over to me. Right. That's, that's not going to happen. But I, I do think that the efficiency just from, from a pure human perspective, right? Like how many times do you want to pick up that phone to actually make that call? And, and there, the, the fact, emails. The emails. Yeah, exactly. Like, oh my God. Exactly. And those nested emails, the fact that I think ocean liners have been very, very good at this. And, you know, this started before COVID too, but have been very good at starting to push uh, their customers online. I think when you're the ultimate car uh, ca uh, capacity owner, you have the ability to real, and especially such a large one, you have the ability to force people to adopt new technology. That's like the, the Hapag Lloyd or Maersk penalties. If you call up 
to book a shipment, you know, book a shipment rather than than if if um, if, if uh, you don't. So, yeah, I think it's been an interesting difference. But yeah, I mean, Air and Ocean definitely, definitely very, very different, very different dynamics too in terms of digitization. Well, how do you? So maybe one last question on this: as you're sort of thinking about the experience for your customers as they manage air and ocean, and you want them to have like this most seamless experience across the different products or, or interfaces they may have. How do you manage that, those drastic differences? And because I think this has been historically, these modes have all been segmented for a reason. They all have all these weird characteristics that are very unique to them. Um, my dad would have hated me saying very unique. That was his pet peeve. You're either unique or you're not, right? You can't be more unique than unique. Um, but how do you, how do you uh, sort of create that more seamless experience when the when the actual underlying characteristics are very different? It, it's difficult, you know, and, and I think it depends if you're looking at this from a forwarder perspective. You know, the, the forwarders that are using our, our suite of tools to sure. book with the carriers or with or with the shippers. Yeah. You know, I'll start with it's it's always kind of you know I, I, rather than just like seeing the praises of what we do I, you know i'd rather actually talk you know trash ourselves a little bit like the things that don't work and that you know i think no freight forwarder really does particularly well uh, necessarily you know and besides our customers who are awesome obviously um <laughs> you know the, the the part on the freighters.com marketplace specifically that that has always been really really difficult is that you're usually not selling underlying capacity that you've already secured. Or if you, even if you have a general pot of capacity, right? If you have, you know, allotments that you've already, that you've already created, or if you have minimum quantities, that's not on a per uh, airplane or per ship basis. Like that's not, you don't have one ULD that, that you know that's going to be loaded on for an airplane, or you don't know the container number where you're going to load that, load that. And what that means is that in many cases, or you know, probably the majority of cases, you're a logistics service provider, a freight forwarder, or a marketplace, or whatever it is that's selling capacity is selling something they don't own. It doesn't have, yeah. And, and that's it's a crazy, it's a crazy idea. And yeah. where it gets a little bit more complicated is that on Fredos.com, especially, a large chunk of our users are very small importers. Uh, and and kind of what we aim to do is to make it a really easy process. And it's so hard for them to wrap their their minds around that because they're used to courier. They're used to just like, they, they know exactly where it is at any given moment. They know exactly how much it's going to cost. And being able to solve for those problems of, hey, you said you're going to get this to the port or you know it's going to get picked up in two weeks. And it took two weeks and three days. And that means you missed your gate in and, and now there's going to be a GRI. <laughs> cool. What's a GRI. And, and that, yeah. that whole, it, it's really hard to solve for that. And it, it, I think one of the biggest parts of the IP, and, and we've spoken about this in the past that we've developed on, on Fredos.com isn't technology as much as a very, very strong SOP, just, you know, standard right. operating procedures. I did, I did that, a story on your SOP because right. it was the first and probably the only time I'll ever do that. But it was interesting to walk through how that came about, right? So right, and it's it's so niche, and I think the the world splits into a very small group of people that are like, of course, that's so important and really hard to do, and a bunch of people that literally just fell, fell asleep when I said the letters SOP. But right, but but it, it like that's the only way to solve for it is creating structure, and the only way to create structure is a to digitize it because offline structure is just never going to work fast enough, and b to have some type of of player to enforce it, and and that's really why I think one of the biggest elements of value that I'm so excited about from a Fredo's perspective is that we're vendor neutral, that we're yeah. not a carrier and we're not a freight forwarder, we're not a shipper, and and being able to kind of take a step out and look at it from the outside, but also figure out how you're connecting the tubes creates a lot of opportunities to think about those problems and try to solve for them. I just wanted to wrap back to the thing you mentioned about selling capacity, intermediaries selling capacity that you don't have. You're, this came up recently because we've written, the JOC we've written a bit this past week about spot, it used, a lot of people using Freydos's index, uh, FBX, um, to see that spot has gone below contract on a lot of lanes and whether that's going to induce shippers to abandon contracts or shift some of their allocation that would have gone contract spot. Uh, a couple forwarders I talked to mentioned that exact thing is like that spot rate that's 500 or a thousand below what their contract is. 
is an is a rate that that forer is offering, but there's no there's no actual space that they have yet right. uh, secured for that rate. They are just essentially using data on the market and what they're hearing and, and maybe a, a promise from someone that they can get a slot attached right. to that rate. So you're right. There's there's all of these like weird nuances that you know you can only learn through bumps and bruises of doing this or on the technology side, you come across it when you're like, oh, wait, I need to structure this, this transaction and attach it to an actual product. Oh, but that product doesn't exist yet because that company right. hasn't bought it from the other company, right? So, And, very and that's, also, that's also why I think you know, th this probably wasn't something that I was thinking about, you know, 10 years ago or whatever, eight years ago, but it's why no matter no matter what gloss of technology you put on a shipper's platform or a freight forwarder's platform, when you don't have the last, you know, the, the bottom pillar of the industry digitized, if the trucks and the airlines and the ocean liners aren't digitized, no matter what, everything after that is going to be imperfect because there's, you're, you're just selling things that you don't have and right. you can build really good data models and be right 80% of the time or 95% of the times, uh, but it's just incorrect uh, for you know for for the the, the shipments that probably really matter. Yeah. Um, with our remaining time, a couple of questions. I haven't addressed probably the biggest thing to happen in Freight House this year, which is you guys announced a couple months ago uh, that you're going public via a SPAC. Yep. Um, do you want to quickly try to describe what a SPAC is and the the sort of reasoning behind uh, a the decision to go public and why to go public in this manner. Sure. Yeah. A, a good question. And, and I, you know, for the people that do know SPACs, SPACs have a, a super negative connotation these days and, and you know, definitely something I'm interested in talking about. So, uh, you know, obviously Freitas has grown a lot over the past eight years um, or so. We work with over 3,500 freight forwarders. Uh, nearly every one of the top 20 global freight forwarders uses our platform internally. We work with, more airlines digitized in our platform than any any other company, over 10,000 importers. And we've been building up this platform that connects all the pieces really, really well. Uh, it's been growing quite successfully. You know, some of the business units at Fredo's are, are profitable. Some of them were intentionally kind of, kind of emphasizing growth instead of profitability right now. Uh, and it, it's been growing really, really well. We, you know, as, as we continue to grow, we've been looking at funding to continue that growth rather than necessarily, you know, shifting into, into profitability right now. Uh, so we we started uh, about a year ago, I would say, maybe a little bit earlier, like looking for, hey, what's our what's our next funding round? And what Svi, our, our CEO, talks about frequently is that we didn't choose a SPAC. We chose the SPAC partner. A SPAC, you know, you, you mentioned it before, a SPAC is a, a special purpose acquisition company. It's basically a blank check company that goes public. Uh, so so in our case, it's a company called Gesher, goes public on the NASDAQ. Um, and then it basically reverse acquires a company. So in this case, it would reverse acquire Fredo's and then we would become FROS on the NASDAQ. Uh, and some companies historically, SPACs were seen as a little bit of a backdoor to go public. Uh, the SEC has, has come down on that very, very, very hard. And more recently, the reporting requirements for SPACs are, are, are much, much more stringent. Uh, so you know, in our case, the reason we chose to go with Gesher and go public you know, together with this company, Gesher, uh, is a unlike most SPACs, their capital is committed. So one of the one of the knocks on SPACs is that a company can, can pr wow. yeah can promise they're going to reverse acquire you, and then a day before you go public, they can pull all their money back, and you're kind of left left with uh, you know looking pretty stupid. So with Gesher, they've they them and their uh, institutional investors have committed eighty million dollars. Uh, you know, no matter what happens, they've they've, they've kind of the SPAC is larger than eighty million dollars, but they committed at least $80 million in total in order to, to go public. Um, so that part was was obviously great. And then the the other component is that it's just a group of very, very, very smart people that are long-term investors. So our new investors that are joining are all going to stay locked into the company for a couple of years, um, will not be selling shares. It's just, it, it really is a funding round that also brings us public. And you know why go public rather than just do a funding round in that case? Uh, my the part that I'm really excited about is that no matter what we do and no matter what we say, there is always a lot of mistrust about what Freitas is actually trying to do. And I, I still get this, you know, from freight forwarders that are sure that our life mission is to cut them out of the game. 
Um, and 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 that's a it's a it's a strange thing to say because our largest customer base are freight forwarders, and you know we, we work mm-hmm. with every freight forwarder, and you know I think you could talk about it till you're blue in the face, and people just say sure, but then they walk around and you know we'll say yes, but they just want to kill us. So I, I think when you are publicly traded, and I'm I'm seeing this from the number of documents that we need to write and the number of lawyers that are going through it, it comes with a certain degree of transparency that companies can literally just open up your book and see exactly what you're doing. And if you're trying to build a vendor neutral agnostic platform, that kind of transparency is actually really, really good. And I think that really plays in our favor for people to be able to look at, you know, exactly what we're telling the SEC, you know, what we're legally committing to from our, from our company vision to build a vendor neutral, neutral platform rather than become a freight forwarder to cut people out. So I, I think that for me is probably the best silver lining of, of this process. Yeah. I mean, I, it's a great point. And I, I think, uh, you know, as we're part of a big data company at S and P Global, and I think we benefit from the same type of, like, the more transparent you are about the data that you provide, the, the more people can trust it, right? So, same with your sort of the model, right? Um, what's the time frame on that? If there is one set up yet, or is that still TBD? Uh, goals by the end of the year. It takes, I mean, just because of all that SEC. Um, stringency and reporting, you know, it's kind of subject to the back and forth that we have with them after submitting documentation, but the goal is 2022. Okay, cool. Uh, good update on that. Uh, maybe last question before we go, I'm going to start. This is, I was inspired by, uh, Ethan has an awesome last question that he asked on his podcast, which is what's your favorite t- pizza topping or pizza type, right? <laughs> so, uh, I, I'm going to steal your idea and I'm going to start asking every guest, who's your favorite band and why? Oh, that's a good question. Hard one. Um, my, my general rule of thumb on how to answer that is find a esoteric band that nobody else knows. Totally. So I can feel good, like I'm cool. Good you know, I, yeah. Yeah. I, I think my, my go-to is probably 90 indie, like kind of like late nineties indie music. So pavement, Rilo, Kylie, bright eyes, just, something that I think at the time made me feel like I was different and you know, kind of made me feel really unique. And now I realize there's 30 million people around the world that all are feeling equally unique from those bands, but yeah. You know what? Uh, I'm gonna, for any future guests who are gonna be on my show and wanna think about who their favorite band is, uh, you will win me no points by going the, the cool hipster indie route only. Like <laughs> I'm all for mainstream. I'm all for any, I want you to be honest, whoever your favorite, if it's, if it's, uh, you know, if it's poison, it's poison. <laughs> if it's, uh, you know, a terrible, a terrible band I, from some other era, be honest with me and that will I, I, I will say my kids were kind of making noise before and I ran into the living room and I was like, hey, Alexa, play songs by Kid Rock. I was like, why did I just say Kid Rock? <laughs> I, went, I don't know. I, like, I don't know where it came from. Probably haven't heard Kid Rock I, in 10 I years. I think we need to end it on that. I think we need to end it on that. <laughs> I think you always end shows with Kid Rock, so yeah. Yeah, there you go. Uh, that will not happen ever again, I promise. Uh, Ethan, thank you so much. It's always great to talk and really enjoy the conversation. How can people get in touch with you? Yeah, LinkedIn. I love, love talking to people on LinkedIn, but Aton at Fredos.com or Ethan at Fredos.com both work. Uh, so yeah, you can see Aton and Fredos in my byline there, so just hit me up there. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for joining. We'll, we'll talk soon, all right? Cool. All right. Just a couple minutes remaining. Great. Thank you so much, Ethan. Always enjoy the conversation with him. Um, Dad joke of the week time. Once again, submitted by my son. Uh, He's the treasure trove of these uh, terrible jokes. Uh, How do you, how do the baseball players on the bench get to the game? Give you a second. The subway. I don't know if he's making these up or if he's reading bad joke. Uh, books and, and feeding them to me, but I'm going to give him credit. And again, once again, any complaints should be directed at him, not me. Um, thank you, uh, son, for providing this week's uh, bad dad joke as usual. So before we sign off, uh, Buzzword explained uh, this show. Liquidity. Uh, this is less a tech term and more of a financial term. So I'm really wading into some dangerous territory here because I am the farthest thing from a finance expert. Uh, but liquidity comes up in a couple different sort of ways uh, related to tech, right? We've heard um, companies uh, are always looking for an exit, right? They, everybody wants to sort of come to a conclusion on their journey and building their company, whether that's 
IPO going public, whether it's selling, uh, whether it's just growing organically and, and, you know, reaping the benefits of that. Liquidity is this hugely important thing because, especially right now, because uh, as I mentioned before, venture investors uh, want a path to profitability. And sometimes all of the uh, money that a company is valued at is not necessarily liquid. So one of the things that uh, I've been hearing over and over from companies is that they have a sort of uh, war chest of cash on their balance sheet um, to, to sort of tide them over, over whatever this next six months, one year, 18 months looks like. So liquidity, the ability to be agile with uh, the money that you have or the that's, that your company is valued at, uh, as opposed to it being completely tied up in equity, but actually having the ability to move and acquire uh, pay your pay your people uh, as as inflation rises. All that stuff is going to be super important in the years ahead. So, uh, with that, another great episode of of uh, Log Tech Live in the books. Thank you again to Farai for sponsoring this episode. I have really appreciate it, and uh, thank you again to Ethan for uh, a great conversation. And most of all, thank you to Sarah and the Let's Talk Supply Chain team, and all of you who attend uh, every single episode. I truly appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. And we'll see you uh, on the first Friday in August. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye.